My first shot at the enemy Leningrad. The streets and squares were filled with sunshine. Golden spires gleamed brightly against the blue sky, and the gardens and parks were alive with fresh greenery and colour. I had seen all these things many times, but now the beauty of my native city seemed especially attractive. At noon on 23rd of July 1941, together with other new recruits, I was marching through the streets of Leningrad towards the front, in the direction of Narva. We gazed at the streets, buildings and parks, and silently said goodbye to our homes and families. The Narva gates receded into the distance, but still we kept glancing back at the city. Immediately upon arriving at our destination, we became part of the 105th Separate Rifle Regiment, which was assembling in an attractive little village. That same night, our company was assigned to man combat outposts. We headed off towards the banks of the Narva River. The commanders and Red Army men strode silently, keeping their weapons at the ready. Private Romanov and I picked our way through some low undergrowth along the banks of the river. Peter was moving in front of me so stealthily that not a single branch rustled and not a single dry twig snapped beneath his feet. Whenever my head or shoulder brushed up against some bushes or an incautious footstep broke a twig, Romanov would stop, turn around and whisper through his teeth, quiet, wrinkling his broad forehead in consternation. Reaching the place that our commander had designated, we lay down beneath a low-growing willow. Below us the water was flowing in a broad current. The mysterious silence of the woods was unsettling, and our ears pricked up at any soft rustle. Everything around me seemed unusual. Even the starry sky seemed to be suspended just above the tips of the pine trees. The birds had long ago fallen silent. Only somewhere in the rye something was repeating a monotonous call. Pete's Polots, Pete's Polots, Pete's Polots. A thin shroud of morning fog slowly rose above the river and meadows. On the edge of the woods, concealed among the overgrowth, a field dove began its mournful call. Ooh, ooh. A magpie began to warble in a birch grove. A squirrel, its head tipped to one side, looked down on us with its bright little eyes and loudly chattered while hopping from branch to branch. At dawn, our company commander, Senior Lieutenant Kruglov, showed up. He dropped down onto the grass next to Romanov without taking his eyes off an isolated cottage on the other riverbank. The home seemed to be empty and abandoned. The windows and door had been boarded up. Suddenly I saw a gate in the fence that surrounded the yard slowly open. A tall woman emerged, stopped and looked around. She was dressed in a long black skirt and a blouse with unusually wide stripes. A yoke lay across her shoulders with a basket of laundry hanging from each end. The woman walked directly across a field to the river. Reaching the bank above the river, she placed one basket on the grass, and with the other slowly made her way down to the water's edge. Gazing at the woman, I thought of my native Belarusia. There were many times when my own mother had hoisted a yoke with baskets onto her shoulders and headed for the Sorianka River to wash the laundry. Where is she now? I asked myself. Has she remained in German-occupied Belarusia, or did she manage to leave with the other refugees? With pain in my heart, I thought of my family, which I had recently left behind in Leningrad. What are my wife and children doing now? How are they? I recalled the early morning in June, when a messenger from the district recruitment centre Rivoenkomat had knocked on my apartment door and handed me a summons to appear immediately at an assembly point. I quickly gathered my things and stopped in front of the bedroom's closed door. I badly wanted to see my wife and children one more time and have a quick talk with them before my departure. I took hold of the doorknob, but stifling my internal emotions, I released it and strode resolutely away from the room. Kruglov's soft voice interrupted my reflections. Comrades, for some reason this woman isn't hurrying to do the laundry. Take a look at her. Kruglov crawled on his belly to the edge of the woods. The woman was standing on the bank and shading her eyes from the sun with her hand. She was looking towards our side of the river. Romanov and I took a close look at her face. Romanov threw his binoculars 
and I threw the telescopic sight on my rifle. The face was long and somewhat gaunt, with a sharp nose and chin. The closely spaced eyes reminded me of a fox's. Apparently satisfied, she squatted down, pulled a thin cord with a weight on one end from the basket, and deftly tossed it into the water. Then, with one hand, she grabbed an article of clothing from the basket and slowly began to wash it. Meanwhile, she carefully wound the end of the cord around her other hand. As soon the weight appeared, she immediately tossed the soaked piece of clothing into the basket, stuck the cord down her blouse and left the riverbank. Glancing one more time in our direction, she easily lifted the yoke with the baskets and hastily returned to the cottage, walking with a man's stride. Kruglov crawled back to us. Well, what do you think? he asked us. It's all very suspicious, comrade commander, Romanov replied. I think so too. But we mustn't show ourselves. We need to keep watching. But she might leave. Don't worry. Some of our guys are over there in that little village. Walking up to the fence, the woman grabbed the gate latch, took a furtive look around and, apparently noticing nothing out of the ordinary, stepped into the yard. Once through the gate, she tossed the laundry baskets against the fence and quickly strode over to the doors of a shed. Romanov gave a soft whistle and commented, You must have come a long way, you devilish Frau, to wash laundry in a Russian river. Then he quickly added, Look, look, comrade commander, that laundress is raising an antenna. Peter Romanov was a radio operator by military training, but in civilian life he had been a German language instructor. His powerful physique was like that of a village blacksmith. Cheerful and clever, he easily got along with people and made friends quickly. However, he had one flaw, he was too excitable. Even now he tensed up all over, as if ready to hurl himself across the river. Easy, Romanov, Kruglov said as he laid his hand on Romanov's shoulder. The German scout will only report what he saw. There are no Russians, the crossing over the river is clear, and the water is of a certain depth. That's just what we need. We all liked our company commander Viktor Vladimirovich, Kruglov, from the first meeting with him. His swarthy, somewhat oblong face radiated an inner tranquillity. His large blue eyes, thick eyebrows, firm lips and absurdly white teeth gave him a youthful look and immediately made a lasting impression. Military orders decorated the commander's chest. From word of mouth among the troops, we knew that he had participated in the Finland campaign, the so-called Winter War with Finland, and had already participated in more than one clash with the German occupiers. While listening to the commander, I scanned the opposite bank like an owl, fearing that I might miss the enemy, which had to be somewhere nearby. Suddenly the sound of motors carried from the opposite bank, and soon we saw enemy motorcyclists speeding across a field. There were ten of them. Greetings, I thought to myself. Here's our first meeting, and how many more such meetings lie in our future? My hands unconsciously gripped my rifle more tightly. I looked over at Kruglov. His face was impassive but his eyes were burning with a malicious fire. You see how the enemy is operating, he said. First they sent out a scout with a radio, and after him a reconnaissance squad on motorcycles. The senior lieutenant looked sternly at us. I'm warning you, not a single shot without my command. With that, he crawled off towards the location of a signalman in the forest. The German motorcyclists drove up to the riverbank, shut off their motors, and without dismounting, began to look attentively at our side of the river. Then, one after the other, they hopped off their motorcycles and, holding their submachine guns at the ready, moved towards the river. Romanov elbowed me in the side and whispered, No way! Have the swine decided to cross over to our bank? How should I know? We have to wait for orders. The Nazis cautiously walked down to the water's edge, removed canteens from their belts and filled them with water. Romanov muttered through his teeth, Eh, hey, if only we could fill their bellies with something other than water. Everything in its own time. We examined the German motorcyclists with curiosity. Their faces and uniforms were dusty from the road. 
They had potato masher grenades on their tightly strapped belts and steel helmets on their heads that settled down almost to the level of their eyes. My conscience compels me to say that for some reason I wasn't feeling any hatred towards the German soldiers at that time. The hatred came a little later, when I witnessed the death of my comrades and the brutal cruelty of the fascist executioners. High above us in the sky, a dogfight was playing out. An enemy plane, enveloped in a black cloud of smoke, swiftly plummeted towards the ground. A black spot separated from the burning aircraft, tumbled through the air, and then seemingly came to a brief halt as a parachute canopy blossomed above it. Under the canopy, the pilot was swinging from side to side as he drifted downward. With agitation, Romanov and I watched what was happening in the sky. From time to time, we nudged each other in the side and said something, passionately hoping for the victory of our pilots, who were dueling with the Messerschmitts. The German motorcyclists were also distracted by what was happening above, seemingly surprised by the sight of a handful of Russian falcons courageously taking on a larger number of German aircraft. Quickly exchanging a few words about something, the motorcyclists returned to their mounts and quickly drove away. Romanov again turned in my direction. Don't be surprised by what I'm about to tell you. There will be a battle soon. Who knows when we'll have a chance to speak calmly and leisurely again. I looked into his eyes. They were affectionate and trusting. Romanov pulled a photo out of the pocket of his combat blouse and extended it towards me. I saw in the photo a man about 35 years old, whose face looked very similar to Romanov's. The same affectionate eyes, smooth high forehead and sharp chin. Returning the photo to him, I asked, Is this your father? Yes, but I've never seen him. He left for the war back in 1914. I was born about a month after his departure. Later my mother told me that he was killed on the banks of this very river in 1917. You can understand my feelings. I can't take a step back in any direction from here. Romanov was perceptibly agitated, and he pronounced those final words rather loudly. Company Commander Kruglov was lying nearby and heard everything. And who told you that we would be retreating from these banks? the senior lieutenant asked. Romanov didn't reply. We will fight here for our fathers and brothers, who were victorious for us on these fields during the Civil War, and we will fight here for Soviet power, Kruglov added. A certain while passed, and then again the sound of motors carried to use from the opposite bank. I spotted a new group of motorcyclists hurrying towards the river. This time an armoured car was leading them. The German armoured car stopped by the cottage. Two officers leisurely stepped out of the vehicle. As they did so, a tall fellow also dressed in an officer's uniform approached them. Observing the Germans through my telescopic sight, I immediately recognised in the tall officer's face the woman who had measured the river's depth that morning. Motioning with his hand towards our bank, the scout was saying something confidently to the other officers, who frequently consulted outspread maps. Soon, their forward units will come up, I thought. How much time passed in the waiting, I don't remember. Then suddenly not far from me a shot rang out, and immediately machine gun fire and rifle fire shattered the calm over the Narva River. I quickly selected my target, the tall officer. I hastily took aim and fired my first shot. The German rocked sharply and slowly dropped to his knees, then to his hands. Propping himself on the ground, he tried to push himself up, but simply couldn't lift his now heavy head. With that final effort, he fell awkwardly onto his chest, his arms splayed in opposite directions. Seeing the first German that I had killed, I didn't feel any sense of satisfaction, just some sort of dull pity for this man. After all, I was no longer firing at targets, as I had done in the Osuaviakim, but at a living being. All of this flashed through my mind like lightning, but I immediately and automatically began to search for a new target in order to repeat what I had already started. When the battle sputtered to a close, Kruglov gathered us all together and with an irritated tone that we didn't understand, shouted, Who fired the first shot? We were celebrating our success, but our commander was furiously swearing at us. 
Do you understand what you've done? We might have dropped many more of them here if you had carried out my order. Private Gerasimov, who was standing next to me, deeply sighed, took a step forward, and without looking at the commander, acknowledged in a deep baritone voice, My nerves couldn't take it any longer, comrade commander. A successful ambush. When our company returned to the battalion's location that evening, a deep trench had already been dug and carefully camouflaged. The other soldiers were eating dinner, talking over the day's events in muffled voices, washing their mess tins, filling their canteens with fresh water or checking their weapons. Our sleep that night in the front lines was very restless. Each of us woke several times during the night and listened with concern to the distant rumble of artillery fire coming from the direction of Kingisep. Not a single sound was audible from our unit's positions. Everything was done silently and without conversation. Our sentries paced cautiously, their eyes constantly looking towards the opposite bank of the river, where we were expecting the enemy's appearance. Many of the soldiers slept on the bare ground, tightly squeezing their rifle to their chest. Their sleep was light. They were ready at any minute to get up and go into battle. Those who could not sleep sat in groups and led whispered discussions. They were remembering their factories, their collective farms, their families. Each of us was hiding our concerns deep inside our hearts, although we tried not to think about the dangers that loomed over us. The faint sound of engines hummed in the sky. Airplanes were heading to the east, obviously towards Leningrad. They've slithered up the snakes, Romanov said. Who knows, perhaps they'll even drop a bomb on my home. I felt a stab of pain in my heart. Feeling my own sense of helplessness, I couldn't stay still. I quickly smoked one cigarette after the other, pacing back and forth along the trench. The beauty of the white night shimmered. The rumbling noise of aircraft passing overhead filled the air. Several days passed. We spent our time working with shovels and axes to deepen and reinforce our trench. There were light skirmishes with enemy reconnaissance groups on the opposite bank of the Narva River. It seemed the adversary was giving us the opportunity to grow accustomed to life on the front lines, before hurling his full strength at us. I closely examined the comrades around me. Everyone was behaving differently before the battle. Some were endlessly checking their weapons over and over again. Some were carefully adjusting their equipment. Some smoked cigarette after cigarette without interruption. A few slept soundly. On the opposite bank of the Narva it was quiet, like on the first day of our arrival here. Now and then, glancing at my watch, I waited for when Viktorov, the company commander's messenger, would return with fresh mail. Off in the distance, beyond the forest in the direction of the city of Narva, there were sounds like a rumble of thunder. The sharp report of gun volleys followed. Then everything merged into a constant roar of battle. In the trench, two soldiers unfamiliar to me were standing around a heavy machine gun. One was older and moved without haste. The other was a young guy, rapid in his motions. The young soldier was plainly nervous. The old soldier gave a laugh. What, Grisha, are you a bit scared? Of course, Uncle Vasya. I've never heard these sounds before. You'll soon hear enough of it. You'll get your fill of it. With that, Uncle Vasya stretched out on his back, pulled an overcoat over his head, and immediately began to snore. Viktorov didn't bring me any desired word from Leningrad. Downcast, I returned to the company command post. Romanov was sleeping beneath the spreading branches of a spruce tree. Light brown curls of his hair were scattered across his tall forehead, partially concealing his dark-complexioned face. His new khaki combat blouse seemed to make him look younger. The company political officer, Vasilev, was lying beside him. He wasn't sleeping. By the light of a torch, he was reading a letter he had just received from his wife. I stretched out next to him. I had often met Vasilev before the war. We had worked together at the same factory and I was well acquainted with him. He had got married literally just a few days before the war. Now, observing the joy with which he was reading and re-reading the letter, it wasn't difficult to understand how much pain Vasilev was carrying inside caused by the separation from his wife. By his nature, 
Vazilov got along well with people. He quickly gained the trust of the soldiers and commanders, though he himself wasn't much of a military man. From the depths of the forest, a command suddenly rang out. Stop! Vasilev quickly turned towards me. Who's shouting? We braced ourselves for an exchange of fire, but nothing happened. Silence settled over the forest. Moonlight fell upon the forest clearing, and we spotted dark figures creeping across it before disappearing into a forest thicket. It was impossible to determine who it was. I nudged Romanov in the side, and he instantly woke up and grabbed his rifle, but the company commander seized him by the arm. Calm down. Soon the sneepers Sidorov and Ulyanov approached us, conducting a stranger in civilian dress. Sidorov reported to Senior Lieutenant Kruglov, We detained a couple of men in the forest clearing, at the bend in the river. One of them put up resistance and we had to kill him, but we took this one alive. They were operating this radio. With that, Sidorov handed over a small metal case, which held a radio. The operator was trying to contact someone, Der Tiger. After briefly questioning the scout, Kruglov immediately set off for the battalion command post to report on what had happened. He took Ulyanov and me along with him. Major Chistyakov, a tall, thin man with piercing, deeply set eyes, opened a map as he listened to Kruglov and began to examine it for the forest clearing, where the enemy scouts had been detained. Pointing at a map quadrangle he had circled with a red pencil, he thought aloud, This isn't just a forest clearing. This is a temporary airfield, abandoned by our pilots. What if we contact the Germans over the radio? Kruglov proposed. No, we shouldn't do something like that now. First of all, we must let the regiment commander know. Senior Lieutenant Kruglov, Ulyanov and I were ordered to set out immediately for the regimental command post and to report on the activities of the enemy scouts. We ran the three kilometres to the command post in ten or fifteen minutes. Lieutenant Colonel Agafonov attentively heard us out, stopping us only to ask us some questions and to clarify certain details. Finishing his cigarette, he walked over to a table and ran his hand over his greying hair, lost in thought. At last he spoke to his chief of staff. The Germans already know our position. It is fully possible that under the cover of darkness they'll make an assault crossing to seize this airstrip. The lieutenant colonel's fingers drummed nervously on the table. Not a single telephone call to the battalion commanders. The Germans might be listening in. We need to set up an ambush around the airfield as quickly as possible. The eyes of the lieutenant colonel were burning with intensity. If the Germans pay us a visit, we need to arrange a warm welcome for them. Do you clearly remember the enemy's call signs? Yes, comrade commander. Tell Chistyakov that I won't object to any attempts to contact the Germans over the radio. Just make sure the battalion commander keeps me constantly informed of events. Thoroughly interrogate that German and send him back to us. When we returned to the battalion, Romanov strode over to the prisoner. The German was short and scrawny, with a frightened, ashen face. Who were you talking with, and what are your call signs? Romanov abruptly asked in German. The prisoner, seeing the Russian's threatening expression, quickly answered, I was communicating with my commander. I don't know what he intends to do. Romanov caught each word of the German and distinguished the slightest nuances in his speech. Kruglov walked up. Oh, I can see you're on good terms, the company commander said, turning to Romanov. Well, that's not a bad thing. A German is a man and he wants to live. But now a fascist is a beast, and let him expect no mercy from us. Romanov translated the senior lieutenant's words for the German. Herr officer, the German scout hastily spoke up, in a heavy burr. They're not fascists, they're German soldiers. Krugloff interrupted the German. Enough of your lying. You did your duty and revealed the location of Soviet forces in this area to your commander. Romanov set up the radio. I donned the earphones and listened in. Above us was a clear, starry sky, but the airwaves were full of sounds. Dozens of voices were speaking, Russian, German and Finnish. They were crying out call signs, 
From every direction, voices were demanding, calling, requesting. Kruglov squatted next to the radio. Well then, should we give it a try? I'm ready, comrade commander. Romanov took the headset from me and raised the mic to his mouth. Achtung, Achtung. Hören Sie, hören Sie. Der Tiger, der Tiger, der Tiger. Ich bin Elefant, ich bin Elefant. The Germans were silent. Romanov repeated the call. Several more seconds of agonizing waiting passed. But then amidst the chatter on the airwaves, he heard the call signs and the words. Why have you been out of contact for so long? Report immediately. Is everything quiet in your sector? Taking Kruglov's dictation, Romanov transmitted, Everything's quiet in this sector. There are no Russians. Elements of our regiment had already taken position around the airfield in the form of an L-shaped ambush. Two companies of the 1st Battalion were occupying the northern side of the field. The 3rd Battalion was covering the western side. The southern approach to the airfield had been kept free of troops, but it had been mined. Next to me, on the forest's edge, two soldiers had concealed themselves behind a heavy machine gun. I noticed that one of them could hardly lie still for a minute. You, Grisha, don't be so nervous one of the soldiers said reprovingly to the other. In our business, fortitude is necessary. Also, it's embarrassing in front of your comrades. They'll see it and laugh at you later. Grisha responded in a faltering voice. Don't scold me, Uncle Vasya. I'm trying... I suddenly recalled that I had seen these two soldiers in the trench that evening during the artillery barrage. Now, just as he had then, Uncle Vasya was instructing his young teammate. The moon illuminated the entire field. Tall willows were standing on the riverbank. In front of us were some tall weeds into which soldiers had settled. To the right of us, some anti-aircraft guns opened up on the sound of engines passing overhead. Golden explosions appeared high in the sky. About this time, Zakharov crawled up to us, accompanied by the soldier Bulkin. Swearing furiously but silently, the platoon commander pointed out a place for him next to us. What? Were you planning to run, you damned wretch? You don't want to fight? Zakharov clenched his fists. The platoon leader told us in a hurried whisper that he had bumped into Bulkin as the private was crawling away into the depths of the forest. What are you saying, comrade commander? Bulkin tried to excuse himself. I wasn't running away. I was looking for some water. I wanted something to drink. Then why the devil do you have a full canteen of water hanging from your belt? Bulkin audibly snuffled, his cheeks quivered, and his eyes were darting from side to side. Zakharov threatened him with his pistol. If I catch you one more time, justice will be swift. Suddenly, in the moonlight, I could see shadowy figures emerge from the direction of the river and begin to advance across the airstrip. The German infantry soldiers were moving cautiously. Behind the advance, I could see other Germans hastily setting up machine guns, the barrels of which were pointing in our direction. Then suddenly a green rocket soared through the sky in a large arc before falling into the middle of the airfield. Immediately, all our heavy and light machine guns opened fire. German soldiers toppled heavily to the ground, others started to crawl away, while a few got up and ran for the steep riverbank in order to find cover from the heavy fire. The young soldier, who had been so nervous before the start of the battle, rose onto his knees, and feeding another belt of ammunition to the machine gun, shouted at full voice, What, vermin? Has it become hot for you? Uncle Vasya, wiping the sweat from his brow, calmly replied, Grisha, this heat is a different matter. The fighting continued for about two hours. The Germans furiously clung to the riverbank and resisted our attempts to drive them back across the river. The smell of gunpowder smoke filled the air. Only with the coming of dawn was the last pocket of resistance wiped out. Under the light of the morning sun, we buried eight of our comrades who had fallen in the night combat. My eyes began tearing as I looked down on the faces of our dead friends, with whom just a few hours before we had been talking and laughing. Among the killed was our platoon leader, Ivan Sukhov. Petr Romanov replaced him. 
1. Due to the high northern latitude of the city, during much of the month of June and until mid-July, the sun never sets far enough below the horizon in the St. Petersburg, formerly Leningrad area for the sky to get dark. The streetlights are not even turned on. Russians thus call this the period of white nights, fighting on the Nava River. That evening, as soon as the twilight started to gather, Romanov ordered the sniper Volodya Sidorov and me to scout towards the river. If you discover anything important, return immediately, Romanov told us. Reaching the edge of the forest, we lay down among some scrub brush and started straining to hear and see anything that we could in the soft glow of the white night, and how a passed, and then another. Everything was quiet. The moon glided up on a thin ripple of clouds, now and then hiding behind loosely spreading clumps of swamp alders or casting a bluish light upon the misty meadows. Sheet lightning from some distant thunderstorm flickered against the backdrop of the pale sky. Carefully watching the opposite bank of the river, from time to time we exchanged a few words. Did you get a letter? Sidorov asked. No, did you? I also didn't. Vladimir hunched his shoulders from the chill, damp air, and then spoke again. There's a lot of dew. Look, there's some fluff in the air, but you can't make out whether it's from a poplar or the ground. My teammate was a native of Leningrad. Before the war, he had worked as a lathe operator at the Red Candidate factory. His family lived on Polyostrovsky Prospect, from where he was anxiously waiting for some news. Sidorov spoke up again. You know, I'm worried for my wife. I didn't manage to say goodbye to her. The day before the war started, she left on a business trip to Minsk. My ten-year-old daughter accompanied me to my departure for the front. Sidorov took a look around, paused to listen and then shifted a little closer to me. You can imagine, he fervently began to whisper. Three weeks have passed since I said goodbye to my dear daughter, and even now her little arms seem wrapped around my neck. I close my eyes, and I can see her tear-stained face. We lay for several minutes quietly, each of us wrapped in his own thoughts. Time passed, the sky grew darker, and the first stars began to appear. Vladimir broke the silence. Left in limbo, that's the soldier's lot. Sidorov was a good sniper. There was something almost feline in his habits. He could sit motionless for hours without taking his eyes from the object that had caught his attention. He had exceptional hearing, but his vision wasn't as sharp as mine. Something stirred in the bushes. Sidorov whispered, Listen, something's rustling. Suddenly I spotted a rabbit. Hopping out onto the edge of the forest, the little creature sat down, took a quick look around, and with its front paws washed its whiskered little muzzle. Then it leisurely hopped towards a patch of clover. On the fringe of the forest, an owl began to hoot loudly. Then again it was quiet. Suddenly Sidorov grabbed me by the arm. What's that? Someone's crawling. We became alert. Several minutes passed, and soon a man appeared in front of us. The unknown man was crawling, breathing heavily and stopping every now and then. When he crawled over a little mound, I caught sight of his dishevelled hair and a grimaced expression on his face. From what he was wearing, it was impossible to determine whether he was a soldier or a civilian. The stranger crawled along on his left hand. His right hand was holding a pistol. Then he dropped his head and began to groan in pain. We crawled over to him. The man lay motionlessly, still holding the pistol. I took the gun from him. He made no attempt to resist. Sidorov rolled the man over. He was breathing fitfully through an open mouth. His face was damp and his eyes wandered aimlessly. His clothes were torn and covered with grime and his right shoulder was wrapped with a bandage on which dark spots showed. Sidorov unfastened a map case from the wounded man's belt and handed it to me. Then he began to examine the man closely. It's a German, Sidorov said. There's an eagle on his belt buckle. Perhaps he's one of those that we hit yesterday. I can't figure it out. Where has he been hiding? We tried to rouse him back to consciousness. Sidorov grabbed his canteen. As soon as the stream of cold water fell into the wounded man's mouth, 
He convulsively snatched the canteen with both hands and began to gulp down the water greedily. A shiver ran down his body. Then he wiped his damp face with his hand and began to mumble something. It was clear that he was delirious. Then the delirium seemed to pass, and our prisoner suddenly hoisted himself on his hands into a half-seated position and began to search the grass for his pistol. Failing to find it, he dropped back to the ground and began moaning softly, biting his lips. We began to discuss what to do, go back to the company command post or keep watching. It was possible someone else might show up. We decided to head back to our company commander Kruglov right away with the wounded man. The German was very weak. Sidorov gave him a lump of bread and a flask with water. I'd never seen a man consume bread and water with such avarice before. When we led the wounded man into Kruglov's dugout, we found all the platoon leaders gathered there. As the senior in rank, I reported, Comrade Commander, we took this prisoner in the meadow. He was crawling from the woods towards the riverbank. We didn't conduct a thorough search. We took a pistol and a map case from him. Kruglov ordered Romanov to interrogate the prisoner while taking the German's pistol from Sidorov. A Luger semi-automatic. I know them well. The Finnish officers had them. The prisoner was a certain Major Strauberg. I'm grateful to your soldiers for the care they gave me, Strauberg announced. An arrogant little smile flickered across the German's face. He wiped his angular forehead and then turning to the Soviet officer, he said with confidence, distinctly pronouncing each word, Do with me as you wish, but we will take Leningrad. Thank you for your candour, but also understand, our city will never be German. You'll crack your teeth on this walnut. The German lifted three fingers to his forehead in salute. Then he turned around with difficulty and paced out of the dugout into the trench, where two guards were waiting to escort him to battalion headquarters. Kruglov opened up a large map that was in the map case and began to examine it carefully. Then he turned to the platoon commanders and said, There it is, the direct road from King Giuseppe to Narva. If the enemy seizes it, our forces won't be able to hold either place. Having cut this road, the Germans will outflank us and force us to retreat. Here, comrades, is the great responsibility that we bear. Kruglov carefully folded the map back up, placed it back in the case, and then handed the case to a runner to take it to the battalion command post. The company commander then announced that according to intelligence reports, the enemy outnumbered us by several times over. We had one advantage, the river in front of our company's trenches and the difficult forested and swampy terrain on our flanks. Enemy tanks couldn't pass here, but we faced a tough fight with infantry, supported by artillery and aviation. Kruglov paused to listen to something. Then he slowly walked to the door, cracked it open and asked, Do you hear that sound? The Germans are bringing up troops to force a crossing. We will not let them onto our bank. We will defend the Narva Kingisep road to the death. He turned towards the plank beds, upon which the platoon commanders were sitting. Don't think that death is frightening only to us. No, the Germans also fear death. Endurance, cunning, mutual support. That's our strength. One more thing we must constantly face the enemy. Teach this and only this to every soldier and officer. If we turn our backs, we're done for. Then you're no longer a force, but a target. When we left the dugout, it was five o'clock in the morning. The air carried the loud sound of motors, which quickly grew. Immediately airplanes appeared from behind the forest treetops. They were flying so low that their light shadows raced across the ground. The soldiers pressed themselves tightly against the walls of the trench, but having spotted the five-pointed stars on the plane's green surfaces, they enthusiastically began waving their hands. The planes were our bombers, returning from a mission behind German lines. At six o'clock in the morning, an enemy reconnaissance plane, a Henschel HS 126, appeared. It fled at the very first shots from our anti-aircraft gunners. Again, everything fell silent. This eerie calm before the battle gripped us all in a state of nervous tension. 
The soldiers were unable to keep still. They kept shifting grenades from one niche to another, wiping cartridges again and again, or repeatedly checking their weapon. Each minute in the nervous wait before a battle seemed like an hour. Only the eyes of the fighters remained calm. They were ready at any minute to face what was worrying their minds and hearts. Eight o'clock. Now the sun's rays were reaching the bottom of the narrow trench. There were the vague sounds of the forest. Next to me, Uncle Vasya was busying himself at his machine gun. As always, he moved deliberately, was spare in his motions, and he was preparing for battle with great prudence. Look, Grisha, how everything's turning out all right for us because of you, he said to his young friend. But Grisha didn't respond. He wiped his smooth face with his sleeve and puffed himself up a bit. Taking on a serious demeanour, as if he hadn't heard this praise, he was trying in every way to act like his senior. Uncle Vasya, by his nature, was a somewhat reserved, very tranquil man, who liked to listen more than talk. He always took his work seriously and carried out the commander's orders precisely and unquestioningly. Grisha worked to clear a little more space for their position and then inserted his spade back into its case, walked over to Uncle Vasya and said inquiringly, Vasily Dmitrievich, yesterday you promised to tell me how you beat the whites in the civil war. To tell you the truth, Grisha, I really don't feel like talking about that now. Our victories, and there were a lot of them, are sometimes attributed only to the cavalry, while we, the foot soldiers, seemingly didn't even fight. The machine gunner smacked his weather-beaten lips as if trying to taste something, and thoughtfully looked up at the sunny sky. It was hard for us to fight back then. We didn't have enough bread or equipment, and we counted every cartridge. I dragged this little friend, and he gestured at his machine gun along military roads for three years of war, cleansing our native land of the Whites. Once it happened that we were chasing the White Poles back towards Lvov. Then one evening, cavalry unexpectedly charged at us from some woods, and I had only three belts of ammunition. The guys were swearing at me for all they were worth. Why wasn't I firing? But the platoon leader was lying next to me and saying, Wait a bit longer, Vasya, until the whites gallop up that little rise, and then cut them down, the devils. And did you wait? Grisha asked. Of course, the commander's word is law. I'm gazing at this wave of cavalry, at their flashing sabres, and I felt ants running up my spine. After all, I was younger back then than you are now, Grisha, but I was patient. As soon as the cavalry emerged from the low ground onto the rise, that's when I cut them down. Yershov, knitting his brows a bit, glanced over at the attentive Grisha. He slowly finished his cigarette and then continued. That's just one story I've told you about, son, but at the front it happens that the enemy will attack you suddenly, and then Grisha, picture for yourself how you'll bang away at him with a little more fervour. The company commander walked up to us and said, Get ready for battle, comrade snipers. Look for the officers and machine gunners, and don't forget about our flanks. The more of these uninvited guests you shoot down, the easier it will be for us, and you, Uncle Vasya, keep the ford under fire and look after the edge of the forest. I watched as a strange, unfamiliar smile crossed my teammate Sidorov's face. He was pale, and his lip 